Welcome everyone, my name is Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Hard Gold with only Fairy-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Fairy-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or the final league member's ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, Fairy-type? In Gen 4? Sylph, so, are, are you okay? But we're going to be playing a special edition of Heart Gold where the fairy type is indeed available. Having been introduced in Gen 6 to counter the overpowered dragon type at the time, fairy type Pokemon are really interesting and quite good overall. I've always wondered how the fairy type would perform if it was available in earlier generations, and today we can find this out. We're going to have a reasonable number of viable encounters for this challenge, all Pokemon that retroactively were given the fairy type later on. And we also have a special bonus encounter available to us at one point, which should be pretty darn cool. Speaking of special bonuses, you'll definitely want to encounter the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, a free-to-play game for both mobile and PC which you can download using my QR code or links below. Recently celebrating their third anniversary as one of the top RPG games out there, Raid hasn't slowed down at all. In fact, there's new content being added to the game all the time, which is one of the things that I love about it. With hundreds of unique characters and bosses, they never stop adding wicked-looking champions that you can play as, and have even added a whole new faction called the Shadowkin, a tribe of warriors recently liberated from the Reign of Evil. Gameplay additions are frequent too, such as the addition of the Doom Tower with over 120 levels of terrifying bosses to slay for seasoned players, which if you like the battle frontier in Pokemon, you'll love. And even a new clan boss, the Hydra, with several heads that each require a different strategy to destroy. Not only that, but Raid just revealed a super-powered, legendary version of everyone's favorite champion, Death Knight. And he's everything we've hoped for. You can get him for free just by logging in and playing Raid for 7 days between now and October 27th. Use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to level him all the way up to level 50 and 5-star Ascension. But that's not all. A new feature called Awakening has just released, and a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you're good enough to take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff, awakening your champions by choosing a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle. All new players, use my link or QR code to get a free starter pack worth almost $30, a free champion, Tayroll, and this cool in-game loot too. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. Thanks to Raid for sponsoring today's video, and let's get into the run. Alright, here we go, Pokemon Heart Gold, perhaps the best Pokemon remake of all time, and with an added bonus, the Fairy type. I'm beyond excited for this one. Speaking of which, we need one of those. How generous of you to offer a Fairy type so early on, Samuel. Okay, he didn't really give it to us, but... Oh, there we go. Would you look at that? My very own... Oh, son of a... This game is just a tease, isn't it? Picking our starter, I decide to go for Totodile this time around. I'm thinking based on the Pokemon available to us that our rival having the Chikorita line might be the hardest challenge. Plus, well, I love Totodile. Quite the nickname, huh? Hey mom, look! I just got a brand new Poke- Oh, I just- uh, okay. Up ahead at Mr. Pokemon's house, we learn about something that's going to be crucial for our run, a mysterious Pokemon egg that we'll actually get to keep later. I bet you can't find this kind of egg in Johto. I just did. Now in my excitement about the egg, I forgot entirely about our battle with Silver here, and I didn't train at all for it, but thankfully, Box Me Daddy pulled through. Do you want to know who I am? I'm gonna be the world's greatest Pokemon trainer. Uh, that doesn't tell me who you are currently. You didn't answer your own question. Oh, I'm Giovanni's son. Wait a minute, what the f***? Before heading out on our adventure, I make sure to have our mom save our money, and if you're doing a Nuzlocke of your own, do this. She actually gets you insane items along the way, which you'll see shortly. Oh man, Lyra must be tripping out. Her entire reality is distorting as her Meryl suddenly has an undiscovered type on it out of nowhere. Alright, now at this point I'm sure a lot of you must be wondering, Sylph, where in the world are you going to find your first fairy encounter in a Gen 4 game? Well, our first is actually available by using the Pokewalker, the device that came with the game back in the day, and which you can use as soon as you have a Pokemon in your box, which we can just use an HM Mon for. 
You see, there was a special event route you could get access by merely having a Jirachi in your game, and merely just getting an event Jirachi in our game doesn't technically break any rules if we don't use it, so... This area is called the Night Sky's Edge, and on this route we can grab none other than a Clefairy, which I catch and nickname Yenfei. Yenfei ends up having a brave plus attack and minus speed nature, not the best, but it does have the fairy type of course and also gets the great moonlight move as part of the event. Pretty darn cool. Up ahead, while battling Bugcatcher Wade, who gives you berries if you register his number, I realized a couple of things. Not only is Clefairy now weak to poison with the fairy type, but also our normal moves no longer get the same type attack bonus or stab. Man, this is different. In no time, we arrive in Violet City, the location of the first gym. Beforehand, we have to take on the Sprout Tower, and unfortunately, Bellsprout give attack EVs. Boy, we're really making a physical Clefairy here, aren't we? At the top of the tower, the Elder was actually a really challenging battle. As we got through his two Bellsprouts with about half health remaining, and then his Hoot Hoot kept hitting Hypnosis like crazy, and non-stab pound isn't exactly the best move to have. Unfortunately, the event Clefairies are all male too, so our Q Charm ability doesn't affect most of the Pokemon that we'll be facing. Thankfully, Moonlight Recovery helped us to get back after being brought below half on four different occasions, and we woke up early enough each time to eventually take him down. Sheesh. Without Moonlight, I don't think that would have been possible. With that, it's time for the Violet City Gym. Thankfully, we can skip through the trainers and hit up the first gym leader, Faulkner, the Flying Specialist. Now, there's a bit of a problem here. Building up defense curls would be a great idea, but his first Pokemon, a Pidgey, has sand attack, so we have to try and take it down as quickly as possible. The Magic Guard ability would have been real helpful here in preventing him using sand attack. Thankfully, he only went for one before we took him down in three pounds. In comes his ace next, Pidgeotto, with us having lowered accuracy. He immediately hits us below half, and then I use Defense Curl. He hits us again to just 10 HP before I use another, which works as he now switches to Gust, a special move. I then use Moonlight to recover health and begin to battle it out with Pound, which does very little. Problem is, he has Roost too. If only he didn't have a special move, Defense Curl would save us, but with him doing more damage than we can do, us having lowered accuracy, and him having more power points for his recovery move? A terribly long process later, and we run out of Moonlights and eventually get taken down. Technically, barely hurting him. I didn't really realize just how hard this would be. This looks impossible. A full reset of the game later, and I get back to Violet City, this time with a new Clefairy who I nicknamed Yenfei. Get it? It's like Yenfei 2 with Roman numerals? I thought it was pretty good, okay? Unfortunately, it also has Q Charm, but it has a hearty neutral nature which should be better in the long run, but perhaps even worse for this gym. However, after a ton of theory crafting, I realized something. We have access to a better move. I talked to the guy west of Violet to get the Rock Smash HM, which has 60 power in this gen, and since 40 power pound isn't stab either, it's a much better choice, especially with the defense drop chance. But this does come at a cost, as the move deleter isn't until all the way at Blackthorn City, so we'll be stuck with Rock Smash for a while. Let's try this again. Turns out, with the neutral nature, we actually outspeed Pidgey and do over half damage. Much better. It just gets one tackle off too, so no accuracy drop. In comes Pidgeotto next, and here we're really hoping for the defense drops, which are a 50% chance. I use my same defense curl strategy to bait out the less powerful gusts, and this time around we're able to kind of outdo his roost as the longer the battle goes on, the more we can drop his defense. This strategy works brilliantly, although we did get brought to just 2 HP at one point before we could moonlight. Oof. In the end, we take him down with below half remaining for our first badge. Where there's a will, there's a way, I guess. We also get the Roost TM for winning, which I have a feeling will be very useful for a later encounter. Leaving the gym, we get a call from Professor Elm, who tells us his aide has something for us at the Mart. Oh, whoops, wrong person, sorry. Here we get something incredible, a mystery egg which actually holds another viable encounter for us. Let's go. Well, at least Rock Smash is useful for something else, as at the Ruins of Alf we can smash these rocks to get, well, yes, old ambers and whatnot, but also colored shards, which we can then exchange in Violet for incredible berries, including even citrus berries. Amazing. 
After running around like an absolute insane person in the city, our egg finally begins to hatch and nets us none other than a Togepi, which of course is a fairy type. I name him Dory, and Dory has a bold plus defense and minus attack nature, not bad, although we'll be stuck with physical flying moves initially. It also has the super lock ability, which is pretty wild, and 80 power extra sensory too. A bit of switch training later, and we can now train up Dory on Wild Mareep for special attack EVs. Our journey also nets us a great item up ahead, the Shell Bell for recovery, and then we make our way through Union Cave. Now, somehow we ended up in this situation in here? Don't ask me how. Somehow I found a way to legally use a slowpoke in a fairy monotype run. Well, actually, it's not a real slowpoke. You just used metronome and got transformed with- Shut up! That strange adventure behind us, we arrive in Azalea Town where the next gym is. Taking on Team Rocket in Azalea was pretty interesting as Dory has a fantastic psychic move, but we do have to watch out for them in this run as poison types are a big super effective threat. Now knowing how challenging this next gym is, I'm desperately hoping that after leveling up and an insane amount of walking on the straight path on Route 33, Dory's happiness is high enough for what I have planned. The Azalea Gym itself went pretty smoothly in terms of the trainers as Extra Sensory was great against the many Pokemon that are part poison. Still, we need more for the Gym Leader as Rock Smash certainly won't help against a 4 times resistant Scyther. Thankfully though, my plan works, as we brought Dory's happiness up enough to evolve it into a beautiful Togetic, a Pokemon I never really get to use, so I can't wait for this. Oh my god, that thing is adorable! It's time for the second gym leader, Bugsy the Bug Specialist. He leads right away with his Scyther, and I lead with our newly evolved Dory. Now, I know that we 4 times resist U-turn, so I can just use Charm to lower his attack, although he used Focused Energy. We just have to look out for crits now, but thankfully, even after his Berry and a Super Potion, we're able to whittle him back down with Extra Sensory thanks to 2 crits, and our own Citrus Berry helped us a lot. However, he got a crit right before we could take him down, but we survived on literally 1 HP before finishing him off with one more attack. Unbelievable. Even with the level up, we cannot stay in, as we can one hit KO, so I send out Yenfei as his Metapod comes out. It's quite a slow process taking down a resistant Metapod with Rock Smash, but the defense drops help as we take him down, only taking a third damage in the process. In comes his final Pokemon though, Kakuna. Now, I had assumed we'd just one hit KO him with extra sensory, but with Yenfei out, I'm starting to realize just how dangerous this is. He has super high defense, four times resists our only attacking move, and has super effective stab poison sting with a chance to poison. Uh oh. He poisons us quickly too, and Moonlight does help when we get low, but we only have so many, both in terms of Rock Smash and Moonlight power points. We just absolutely need defense drops, or we're toast as I can't switch either. This is a long grind, and after running out of Moonlights, we barely don't take him out on a sliver, but on our third last Rock Smash, we can get the KO and the win. Man oh man, that was insanely close. Who would have thought a Kakuna could cause so much trouble? The challenge isn't over yet though, as Silver then challenges us to battle before we leave the town. He leaves with a Ghastly, so I send out Dory, who can immediately one-hit KO him with extra sensory after he just used Mean Look. Dory levels up to level 19 here though, which is the exact cap for the next gym, so I'm getting nervous. In comes Bayleaf next, who uses Poison Powder, but we get a Charm off to lower his attack. He then uses Reflect as I get a Yawn off, and now Resisted Razor Leaf hardly does anything. Extra Sensory only does about a fifth though, and here I switch into Yenfei for the Rock Smashes, hoping for the defense drops. After two, his Reflect wears off, but he has Synthesis. Ugh. Just like a Roost Strat though, we can progressively lower his defense, but the Reflex don't help at all in that regard. It's a very long process, but eventually Yenfei gets him to the red, at which point we can switch Dory back in for the extra sensory KO. From there, Zubat is thankfully a one-hit KO. We cannot use Dory at all from now until the next gym leader though, as that level cap is getting close. Knowing we desperately need a way to ease our XP load, it's time to get another encounter, this time from the event Amity Meadow Root of the Pokewalker, an Inkly buff, which I nicknamed Amber. Amber has a lax nature, plus defense and minus special defense, not bad I suppose, and some great moves too. To help upgrade our team a bit, I also teach the Roost TM to Dory for a much needed recovery method. After rescuing the Farfetch'd in the Alex Forest, we can head back to the Cutmaster's house to get the charcoal item, which should be useful later on. 
A short trip then brings us to our next destination, Goldenrod City. I immediately head to the department store to grab Protect, Light Screen, and Reflect TMs, and also some berries from the drawing center. Now the game corner here has some great TM and item rewards, but if I'm honest, Voltorb Flip is incredibly tedious and we don't need them yet, so I'm gonna be lazy for now. The normal type Goldenrod Gym is upon us, and in here, Amber actually performs quite well with Headbutt, not only with 70 power, but also with Stab too, since Amber is part normal and part fairy too. Pretty awesome. Although, I must say, it didn't occur to me that other trainers' Pokemon would also be fairy too in a normal gym, so things like Snubble were a bit more of a challenge than expected. After getting his happiness up, Amber evolves into a Jigglypuff along the way, adding some great power and bulk to our team. It's time. The most infamous gym leader of them all, Whitney. You can never be sure that you're prepared against her, but let's just go for it. She leads with a Clefairy, and it ends up being shiny out of nowhere. I have no idea what's going on here, but I send out Amber. These two are historic rivals, but I can get a defense curl off before smashing her with a few headbutts, even though we got infatuated too, but Amber emerges victorious even through her damn metronome, which is always scary. In comes the big threat, Miltank. With our defense raised, I'm feeling confident enough to go for Charm, and we get one off after being brought low. With her having minus two attack now, I feel safe switching into Yenfei. Now, I kid you not, we got four rock smashes off after getting attracted to bring her to a sliver, then I knew I could switch in Dory safely as she potioned, but Dory then gets attracted and then flinched by Stomp five turns in a row. Are you kidding me? I was so mad. Our Citrus Berry saved us though, as I could finally get another charm off. With her incredibly low attack now, I could then roost through Attract and proceed to whittle her down with extra sensory, being flinched and attracted like crazy and brought to just 8 HP in the end after a critical hit stomp. But we make it through the Attract and flinch chance to take her down at the last second. I celebrated so hard here. Oh man, thank god we taught Roost when we did. Unbelievable. Three badges. Look how bad our team is hurt too. As if that wasn't bad enough, it turns out the National Park is the single biggest tease ever. It is a bug catching contest day and you can win a shiny stone reward, but only after getting the National Dex. You can also get a Soothe Bell here too, but we've already done all of our friendship evos required. There is a shiny stone just on the overworld here too, but you need rock climb after getting 16 badges. I have no words, none at all. Alright, side note, I'm currently reading Eric Neumann's The Origins and History of Consciousness, which is all about, like, symbolic representations and whatnot, and... Oh, the symbolism with this girl asking about squir- No, on the tree? Okay, you know what? Never mind. What a good rock-hard tree that is. Good thing we have Rock Smash Clefairy, am I right? Next up, we arrive in Ecruteak City where the next gym is, but to the east of the city we can actually grab a new encounter first, as this is where Mount Mortar is located. Oh hey look! There he is! Alright, in reality, this thing is a 1% encounter. Yup, a 1 in 100 chance of finding him every single encounter. It takes a damn long while, but eventually we find it, a Meryl, which I catch and nickname Eula. Eula has a relaxed nature, which gives him plus defense and minus speed. Not ideal, but he has huge power, which is incredibly necessary to make him even half decent. Let's go. Now, I actually tweeted about what this game made me do next. We can go east of Ecruteak to Route 38 for another encounter, but... Yup, it's another 1% encounter. Two 1% encounters consecutively. This was not a fun couple of hours. It might be all worth it though, as we eventually find it, a Snubble, which I noticed had Intimidate when the battle started. We catch it successfully and nickname her Mona, and Mona has a hasty plus speed and minus defense nature, not bad. Granbull is one of my favorites, especially as a fairy type, so I can't wait for this. Turns out Meryl evolves quite early at level 18, so a bit of grinding turns him into a solid Azul. And with huge power, it technically has a base 100 attack, which is great. Not long after, Mona also evolves, netting us a beastly Granbull, which I can't wait to use, and who I also teach the dig TM we got from the National Park. Yes, there was at least one thing it gave us. In the Burn Tower, we have an assembly of four legendary trainers and three legendary Pokemon, too. Pretty cool. Here, Silver challenges us to battle, and we can take down his Ghastly the same way as last time. 
In comes a new Magnemite though, not good for a flying type, so I switch in Mona. And he missed Supersonic, so with a plus speed nature we outspeed and nail him with a 4 times super effective dig KO. In comes Bayleaf next, and I keep Mona in for the headbutts, hoping for the flinch, and although we didn't get one, we still do huge damage, although he recovered at one point. Not wanting to risk a Razor Leaf crit with the poison, I switched in Dory, who could yawn and put him to sleep, and chip him down for the knockout. His final Pokemon is Zubat, and to play it safe, I switched in Mona for the Intimidate, and then went into Eula for the Bubble Beam KO. Much better than last time, this team's coming together. The Ecruteak Gym is upon us, and Dory performs amazingly here, taking most things down with extra sensory and getting crazy amounts of special attack EVs along the way. Before the gym leader, I made sure to pick up the Surfe Gem from the dance studio and taught it to Eula, as it's the best move that we can get onto a waterfall around the move deleter anyway. A terribly long game corner grind later and I could pick up the Silk Scarf, not very useful for this gym. The Ice Beam TM I taught to Yenfei, and also the Thunderbolt TM for Amber too. The fourth gym leader is Morty, the ghost type expert, and his team is often devastating. I'm a bit nervous because our team is incredibly slow. With my best plan in place though, let's give it a try. He leaves with a Ghastly and I send in Mona. Surprisingly, we outspeed and Bite instantly KOs him. Alrighty then. In comes Gengar next and it immediately goes for Hypnosis, but I had attached a Chesto Berry so we wake up and land a Bite, but it doesn't quite take him down before his Berry activates. He then hits us hard with Shadow Ball to below half, but another does the job. In comes Haunter next, and I know this one can't do any damage to us besides Curse or putting us to sleep and then using Nightmare, so I stay in, and he goes for Curse, so Bite smashes him instantly. Unreal. In comes his final Pokemon, a stronger Haunter, and with just 21 HP left, I have to switch. Here I go into Amber, and looking at his moveset, you can see why. With our part normal type, he can't hurt us except for Sucker Punch and Curse, so a couple Thunderbolts do the job. I think that's the easiest time I've ever had with Morty. That worked surprisingly well. Now being able to use Surf on the overworld, I head back to the ruins of Alf to find a secret entrance. In this room, there's a secret part where you can use Flash to unlock a secondary room, and in here we can grab some cool items, including... A Moonstone. One of the very few places in this game you can find one. Our journey next brings us to... Ba Baoba. I'll never get his name right, who is going to be key in helping us to get another encounter later on. Oh, come on, let me in. I, I, I found your child. <laughs> we next arrive in Cianwood City, the location of the next gym. Looking at the next gym leader's team, I decide to use our Moonstone on Amber to evolve him into a bulky Wigglytuff, yet another Pokemon that I never really get to use. Now, the Cianwood City gym calls to mind an unfortunate fact. If only the Safari Zone was open, as it holds the ultimate, and I mean ultimate, encounter to counter this gym, but oh well. Eula does a great job against the trainers, at least with Surf, and gets a lot of great attack EVs along the way. The fifth gym leader is Chuck, who can be a surprising challenge, so even with the fairy team, I'm not underestimating him. He leads with a Primeape, so I send out Mona to get the Intimidate off immediately. He went for a double team, so I use Silk Scarf Boosted Headbutt, which does just over half. Another double team doesn't phase Mona though, and another headbutt KOs him. Let's go. In comes his ace next, Polyrath. Now this thing does have Focus Punch, which is dangerous, but knowing we resist it, I know he'll go for either Surf or Hypnosis, so I switch in Amber with the Chesto Berry. He did go for Surf though, and two bring us below half, and then Thunderbolt gets a crit right off the bat, but barely doesn't KO before his Berry. He then lands a Hypnosis though, but our Chesto Berry comes in clutch for that reason, and we get a two-hit KO anyway for the win and our fifth badge. That was pretty darn smooth. Outside the gym, Chuck's wife gives us the fly gem. Suddenly she's taken a liking to us after we displayed our Alpha Chad dominance over her husband, I guess, which I teach to Dory for a good stab move. I use it to go back to Cherry Grove briefly, as now that we have Surf, we can grab the Mystic Water item to boost Eula's water moves. Now, I have some upsetting news. At the top of the lighthouse, we revived Amphi, but the resulting massive surge of electricity instantly annihilated Eula. Rest okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> While leaving, we get a call from Baoba that the Safari Zone is now open. Let's hit it up. In the default forest area of the Safari Zone, we can find our final Johto region encounter, none other than a Mr. Mime. I know these things are fairly hard to catch though, but thankfully it allowed me to throw five balls without fleeing, and we successfully caught it. Ooh, that would have been bad otherwise. I name her Tao, and Tao ends up having a modest nature, plus special attack and minus attack. 
We usually have some bad luck with nature, so getting the perfect one feels even better than usual. Finally, we have a fast Pokemon on our team too, and it has the filter ability which reduces damage from super effective attacks. Perfection. I am not a talker. Finally, I found my people. Picking up the game the next day, we can do something quite cool. Going back to the department store on Sundays, you can talk to this lady who will give you the return TM if you have a friendly Pokemon. Fantastic at 102 power with max friendship. At the Lake of Rage, we can also surf north to get a wicked item, the Choice Specs. Too good. After destroying the Red Gyarados, which surprisingly survived a Thunderbolt somehow, we can intimidate Lance with our Fairy types. Get it? Because Granbull has intim- Okay, never mind. Oh, hello there. You look like a friendly kitty. Can I pet you? Okay. Tao? Wait, why are you acting all weird, man? What? Ew, what? Heading into the rocket hideout and witnessing a murder allows us to go in further to grab the Thief TM to get some type-boosting items off wild Pokemon. Tao performs amazingly against Team Rocket with Psybeam eviscerating all the poison and even some non-poison Pokemon too. Near the end, we have a double battle with Lance against Ariana, and I attached the Choice Specs on Amber so we could avoid Arbok's Intimidate and take everything down with Thunderbolts, leading into her ace, Murkrow, which otherwise can cause some problems. The Mahogany Gym is next because the level cap for it is actually lower than Olivine's for some reason, and Amber was great here too with either Headbutt or Thunderbolt against the Water and Ice types. The 6 Gym Leader is Price, the Ice Master, and I think I have a great plan for his team. He leaves with a Seal, so I send out Eula. I use Defense Curl off the bat as he uses Hail, and now I go for Rollout which gets double power if you use Defense Curl on the previous turn. He did survive the first and got two Icy Winds off to drop our speed, but another does the job. In comes Piloswine next, which hits a Mud Bomb to drop our accuracy, unfortunately, and we miss our next one. Ugh, I knew that was gonna be too good to be true. Regardless, we can now survive another attack, have our Berry activate, and then nail him with a Stab Super Effective Surf for the KO. In comes his final Pokemon, Dugong, and knowing we resist all of his attacks, I'm like, alright, let's get some revenge for that nonsense. I set up Defense Curl again, and then smash him with two rollouts after he used Rest for the win. There we go much better. Immediately after that battle, I head to Olivine City to face our next challenge, the 7th Gym Leader, Jasmine. As a Steel-type trainer, we realistically should be very worried based on our type matchup, but another plan comes into mind. She leads with a Magnemite, and with her plus speed nature, Mona is able to outspeed and take it down with Dig instantly. In comes Steelix next, so I switch into Eula, and she just went for Sandstorm, so Surf KOs her immediately. Her final Pokemon is another Magnemite, quite a threat, so I switch back into Mona, and as I thought, she went for Thunder Wave to paralyze, but I had attached a Cherry Berry so we get healed and could go for the 4 times damage dig again for the knockout and the win. Not bad at all. 7 badges. The Goldenrod Underground has us don a rocket uniform, and oh yeah, sure, I, I won't try to scare people at all with my rocket outfit and a grand bull of all things. Let's go say hi to Bill. Bwah! Son, I am disappoint. Aw oh, man. Now he definitely won't gift us an Eevee that we can turn into a Sylveon. Just kidding. No Sylveon in this game, unfortunately. Would be cool, though. Rescuing the Goldenrod Radio Tower goes well, especially with the Choice Specs Modest Stab Psybeam. Tau is terrifying in more ways than one. Speaking of terrifying, we also battle Petrol, but for once we don't have to worry about his damn exploding coughings and wheezings as Tau eviscerates his entire team with ease. Damn, that feels good. Uh, okay, something about this setup here is just incredibly disturbing. Jiggly? Wiggly? W why do you both stare like that? Hello? <laughs> now here, our mom's savings finally start coming into good use as we get a second Moonstone, which are near impossible to find. Using it, we can get another great evolution as our starter, Yenfei, evolves into a bulky and powerful Clefable. Love it. The Underground has us battle our rival Silver again, and his team has grown quite a lot. Fortunately, we now have Tao, though, who evaporates both his Golbat lead and his Haunter with super effective Psybeam. That type coverage is great, as Poison is a big threat otherwise. In comes Sneasel next, and who would have thought it, but Rock Smash Clefable is the perfect counter, devastating it in one hit. Magnemite is then handled by our dedicated Magnemite counter, Mona, with the Cherry Berry and Dig Strat again, which works perfectly, and now in comes his fully evolved Meganium. We now have a good counter against him though, as I switch in Dory to use Yawn, stall out the Reflect a bit, and can now use Super Effective Stab Fly to great effect, although a crit certainly did help with the KO. In the basement, we rescued the Director, and... Alright, uh, you gonna leave? 
I just risked my life to save you. Why are you standing there? Run! Along the way to the top of the tower, Tao hits level 39 and learns none other than Psychic. Alright, it's over. In the second last room, we have a battle with Ariana Grande, and she leads with her Intimidate Arbok again. Oh no, whatever are we gonna do? Bam! Murkrow is a huge threat to Tao though, so I switch in Yenfei when it comes out for the Ice Beam KO, just taking a Nightshade in the process, and then in comes Vileplume. Stab's super effective acid does hurt, but two Ice Beams do the job to finish off her career. No new albums, I guess. In the final room stands Executive Archer and, well, who would have thought it, but go Choice Specs Azumarill. Surf devastates his entire team, although I wasn't expecting even his Hound Hour to outspeed us as those flinches were quite annoying and we ended up with a bit over half health remaining. Before the final gym we have to travel through the ice path, but I'm not complaining as it's a really cool place and nets us things like the Waterfall HM, the ideal move for Eula, and also the Never Melt Ice later on to boost the power of ice moves which might be vital. Emerging lands us in Blackthorn City, and before anything, I hit up the Move Deleter and Tutor House to get rid of Surf on Eula and teach Waterfall instead. Oh, and we can finally access the other side of the Dark Cave on Route 45 to get the Black Glasses item from the weirdo in there. That Move House also allows us to delete Rock Smash off Clefable, and Granbull can learn the Elemental Fang moves, so I teach him Ice Fang, which should be a great asset. Speaking of which, it's time for the Dragon-type Blackthorn City Gym. And the Never Melt Ice combined with Yenfei's Ice Beam devastates all the Dragon types in here, and Amber's Thunderbolt helps with the various Seedras in there too. At the end stands the 8th and final Gym Leader, Claire. Her team is always terrifying, but in all honesty, I think I'm feeling the best I have in a while about battling her. She leads with an Intimidate Gyarados right off the bat, but I lead with Amber who tanks Bite with ease and lands a 4 times damage Thunderbolt for the instant KO. A good start. In comes Dragonair next, and I wanted to scout if she'd use Thunder Wave, but she didn't, so I just get a couple Thunderbolts off for the hell of it before switching into Yenfei to tank two Aqua Tails and take it out with Ice Beam. However, in comes her ace, Kingdra next. We have a perfect counter though, Eula. Two smoke screens do lower our accuracy though, but our newly learned Double Edge brings her below half immediately, but her berry tips the scales unfortunately. She then hits a Hydro Pump, which we tank incredibly well, hardly does anything. I then go for Waterfall just to tip her past half for the double edge range as I don't want her to heal, but she preemptively switches out of nowhere into Dragonair. Oh well, at least we can reset her accuracy now as I switch into Yenfei who destroys her with two Ice Beams, surviving in the red. In comes Kingdra again, so I switch back into Eula, tanking another Hydro Pump with ease, and we have our Citrus Berry activate too. I was gonna execute my plan from here, but all of a sudden she gets a crit, and it does enough to take Eula down instantly due to her Sniper ability. Oh, Eula was by far our best option, as Sniper Crit Stab Hydro Pump from that thing would have taken out anything on our team. Why did that have to happen? We had such a good counter. From there though, I switch in Tau for the Psychic, but she survives in the red, and thankfully doesn't get a crit on Hyper Beam at least so we can take her down with another. That was a heavy loss, just brutal, but we got her 8th badge at least. After Elm tells us the Kimono Girls are waiting for us, ooh, she jealous, we head to the Ecrotic Dance Studio to do battle. Having to battle all 5 of them consecutively with no healing is actually a massive challenge. I led with Mona, who could do big damage with Return and Intimidate Umbreon at least, and thankfully we made it through Confusion for the KO, could survive a Psychic from Espeon in the red and respawn with the Double Power Payback KO, then for Flareon I switched into Dory, who got burned and couldn't finish the job unfortunately, but Tao could, then Jolteon was able to be stalled down by Yenfei with Moonlight despite her infinite double teams, and finally Vaporeon was a huge struggle but ultimately Amber pulled through with the Thunderbolts for the KO from the red. Sheesh. Man oh man, I'll never get over how beautiful this area is. After ruining the millennia-long prophesied arrival of Ho-Oh for the entire Johto region, we arrive at the final test, for our legs at least, Victory Road. The long journey is perilous, but there are no trainers in it in this game for whatever reason, so along the way we pick up the amazing Earthquake TM before arriving at the end where Silver challenges us to battle. With the level cap so high now, we're able to outdo him with Yenfei going nuts with Flamethrower against both his Sneasel and Magneton, then smashing his Meganium with two Ice Beams as well. 
From there, his Haunter and Golbat were both easy knockouts with Tau Psychic, and finally his Kadabra was handled by a switch into Dory, who I taught the Shadow Ball TM to, smashing him in one hit, which I was a bit surprised by. That win grants us access to our final destination in the Johto leg of this journey, the Pokemon League. After fulfilling the rest of our EVs and gathering any remaining items and TMs that we need, it's time to take on the Elite Four of the Indigo Plateau. The first Elite Four member is Will, the Psychic-type trainer, and his team is actually a bit of a struggle for us on the face of it. But after a bunch of theory crafting and running calcs, I think I might have a good option. He leaves with a Zatu, and I send out Dory. He goes for me first to out-prioritize us with our own Shadow Ball, then our choice Specs boosted Shadow Ball takes him down. In comes Jinx, a big threat, but I know it only has the physical Ice Punch, which we can survive, and we do below half and then land a Shadow Ball, but it barely doesn't KO on a sliver. Uh-oh. I know he'll heal though, and then we get a higher range to take him down on the next hit. Whew. In comes Executor next, and this is exactly why I came into this battle at high level 47. So we'd level up and outspeed this thing, but it turns out it might be a speed tie as he outspeeds, but just goes for Reflect so we can then one-hit KO it. That was close. His following Slowbro and his final Zatu then both get taken down by Shadow Ball as well. Much messier than I thought it was going to be, but we pulled it off nonetheless. The second Elite Four member is Koga, the former gym leader and poison specialist, on the face of it a nightmare for our team. He leaves with an area dose, so I send out Tao for the instant psychic one hit KO. In comes Fortress though, and with Psychic Resistance and Explosion 2, I have to switch, so I send in Yenfei as he uses Toxic Spikes interestingly enough, then 4 times damage Flamethrower KOs him. In comes Muck next, and Gunk Shot could potentially KO everything that we have, so I was gonna switch in Grand Bull for Intimidate, but accidentally misclicked into Tau, but he just used Minimize. Whew. We just need to hit a Psychic after his Minimize though, and we do for the one hit KO. In comes Crobat next, and with everything getting poisoned, this is rough, but I send out Mona for the Intimidate, and then can land an Ice Fang after he double teams repeatedly. It doesn't KO, and then his berry activates, then Poison Fang slams us low, but we land another Ice Fang for the KO, being brought to the red by Poison. His last Pokemon is Venomoth, and not wanting to risk it, I go into our bulkiest Mon with recovery, Yenfei, who tanks a couple attacks, but then hits itself in confusion and gets poison damage down to the red. Goodness gracious. From there, I can send in Dory, though, who finally ends this nightmare with Fly. Well, we pulled through at least. Up next is Bruno, the fighting specialist, and, well, I'm sure you can imagine what happened here. I rare candied Tau to 49 and then went nuts with Psychic to take down his Hitmontop, then added Insult to Injury with Magical Leaf against his Onyx, and then his Machamp, Hitmonchan, and Hitmonlee all succumbed to a modest, stab, super effective, twisted spoon boosted 90 power Psychic. Man oh man, Bruno must see this thing in his nightmares. I mean, to be fair, we all do. The last Elite Four member is Karen, the Dark-type trainer, and one might imagine that this should be a fairly easy battle for a Fairy-type team, but I'm not underestimating her. She leads with a bulky Umbreon, so I send out Mona to utilize the same strat we did against the Kimono Girls, except this time I attached a Person Berry to snap us out of confusion, and Intimidate combined with two returns left her pretty helpless. Vileplume then comes out, so I hit it with an Ice Fang for over half, and froze it, but she thought out immediately, but then missed her Stun Spore. But then, we missed Ice Fang. What? But she misses Stun Spore again, and we hit this time to take her down. That sequence was ridiculous. In comes Houndoom next, would have been great to have Eula here, but she just went for Nasty Plot so Earthquake devastated her. Gengar is up next, and I know we have to watch for Destiny Bond, so I switch into Tau as she hits a Focus Blast. My calcs tell me we should actually outspeed here, and we do as Psychic KOs her. Nice. Her final Pokemon is Murkrow, so I use Reflect to raise our team's defense as she goes for Pluck. Then I can safely switch into Amber to tank whatever she throws at us and land a Thunderbolt for the KO and the win. It's time. The final challenge, the champion, Lance the Dragon Master. Now with a fairy type team, again, we'd assume we'd have a relatively easy time with this, but I'm taking no chances. I'm glad at least that our entire team is immune to Dragonite's outrages. He leaves with a Gyarados, so I send out Amber to tank the Intimidate and Waterfall, but we flinch, so he lands another before a Thunderbolt takes him down. 
In comes one of his Dragonites, so I switch into Mona to intimidate him, but he went for Thunder, which does a scary amount. He then Thunder Waves us, but I had attached a Cherry Berry for this reason, so we can now land a 4 times damage Ice Fang, but he survives in the red. Knowing he'll heal, I take the chance to switch in Yenfei. With him intimidated, I know we can tank whatever he has, so I take the opportunity to use Cosmic Power to raise our defenses even further, although he did paralyze us. I get another off though, as he misses Thunder, and then land a 4 times super effective Ice Beam for the KO. That's better. In comes another Dragonite, and Blizzard hits, but doesn't do much now, as Ice Beam devastates it as well. In comes his final Dragonite now at level 50, which uses Safeguard, but somehow it survives an Ice Beam and gets Berry Recovery. He then goes for Fire Blast to bring us below half before our Berry, then we make it through Paralysis yet again for the KO. Yenfei, you are a legend. He sends out his Aerodactyl next, and with such good health, I stay in, and he misses Rock Slide, and we land an Ice Beam, but it doesn't quite KO. The next turn, he hits one, but we make it through Flinch and Paralysis Chance to KO him. Unbelievable. In comes his final Pokemon, Charizard. Not wanting to push my luck, I switch in Dory as Air Slash does a third or so. Another brings us below half before our berry, and then we land a Yawn. A lot of our team is hurt, so I stay in as Air Slash brings us to 32 HP, but then we get a Roost off as he falls asleep. With him asleep, I'm now feeling safe to switch in Mona, and he stays asleep as we land a 4 times super effective Rock Tomb, but it barely doesn't KO on a sliver. That's okay though, as my plan allows for him healing. I can use Return twice in a row now for better accuracy now that his speed was dropped, but the second brings him to just a sliver again, and he lands an Air Slash, but we survive in the red. Sheesh. Thankfully from there, he heals again, and we get a crit to the red, but he heals yet again. Man oh man. Another return gets a low roll though, and now I know that I have to switch. I send out our only full health Pokemon, Tau, and Fire Fang doesn't do as much as it should have thanks to Intimidate. I then go for Psychic, but he survives on a sliver in the red again. Are you kidding me? Air Slash then nails us below half, but we can finally, finally outspeed and take him down with the final attack. That was unreal. He could have very well started a sweep there at some point, but we did it. We became the champion of the Indigo Plateau with just fairy types, however, our adventure is not over yet. Heading back to Elm's Lab, we get the SS ticket, which we can bring to Olivine City to board the SS Aqua. Upon arriving, we talk to Professor Oak, who upgrades our Pokedex to the National Mode. Sword and Shield are so jealous right now. With that in hand, we set sail. Searching for a missing girl on board, the captain says, She can't get off the ship, so she must be hiding somewhere. Well, I, I mean, she could. A long journey brings us to the Kanto region where a massive challenge awaits. I will never be able to express how nostalgic this is for me. Now we can do something amazing now that we have the national decks. We can tune into the Pokemon Talk radio channel on the Pokegear to hear about swarms, and on Route 34 back in Johto we can find our final encounter using them, a Ralts. So cool. I name her Kokomi, and she has a bashful neutral nature. Technically, you could also get a fairy type Mawile from Swarms too, but those are exclusive to Soul Silver, unfortunately. While grinding, I made sure to wait until level 28 so that she learned Psychic before letting her evolve into a Curlia. A little bit of grinding later, and we get an even more incredible evolution as Kokomi evolves into a Gardevoir, adding some huge power and bulk to our team. But what is it that you're looking for? The keys to my heart? Shortly after, a miracle happens as we finally get the Choice Scarf item from our mom's savings. Let's go. Now for those of you who have never played these games before, you'll know that the Kanto Gym Leaders themselves are usually quite easy. As by this point, you typically have a well-rounded and fully EV trained team with great items too. But you can still have some cool battles. For instance, with the help of some EV reducing berries from the Pokewalker, I could max out the speed on Grand Bowl and attach the Choice Scarf. That way we can go nuts against some of the fastest Pokemon in the game on Lieutenant Surge's team and sweep through them all. Too good. Now since it turns out Rock Climb is only obtainable with all 16 badges, I instead did the post-National Dex Pokeathlon rewards and got a shiny stone that way which we can use to get our final evolution as Dory evolves into a beastly Togekiss, which gets wild stat increases. This was absolutely necessary as the biggest Kanto gym leader threat was Sabrina, so I maxed out our special attack and speed on Dory for the choice spec Shadow Ball strat, but even that was overconfident as Espeon survived one and Mr. 
Mime outsped with Light Screen, causing me to be in the red before Alakazam came out and having to scramble a plan together to defeat that damn thing. The Move Deleter and Tutors helped a ton from there though, being able to get rid of Fly and teach Dory Air Slash and Aura Sphere too. We don't have Serene Grace, but hey, still an amazing Pokemon. And I gave him a redemption opportunity against Erika, and let me tell you, Choice Specs Air Slash from a Togekiss? Lawless. Oh, and hitting up Pewter City, Brock was quite the fun time with all of his Pokemon being four times weak to Kokomi's Choice Specs Magical Leaf. Alright, playtime's over. With all 16 badges in hand, it's time to tackle the final challenge, Mount Silver. During the long trek, we can pick up one of the best items in the game, the Expert Belt, before eventually reaching the summit. After tons of grinding and preparation, the strongest trainer in the two regions awaits, the legendary Red. Let's see what we can manage. He leads with his insane level 88 Pikachu, and I lead with Mona. You bet your ass we're doing what you're thinking. Choice Scarf Earthquake to decimate that threat right away. In comes Blastoise next, so I switch in Kokomi to tank Blizzard, but he gets a crit to below half. Oh, not good. From there though, I go for max power Thunderbolt, but he survives on what must be 1 HP somehow, then uses super effective flash cannon to take her down before the hail then takes him down at least. That was super unfortunate. In comes Snorlax next and I switch into Amber. I can go for Charm right away to lower his attack and then Blizzard doesn't do much. Here I take the opportunity to set up Light Screen to help our team and even through Hail and Red Full Restoring, a series of returns eventually takes that thing down. In comes Venusaur next so I switch into Tau to tank Giga Drain and respond with a Psychic for the one hit KO. Charizard then comes in, and I have nothing to safely switch into, so I just go for Psychic with the Choice Specs, but he survives and responds with a massive Flare Blitz to take down Tau. Ouch. The Recoil and Hail don't even take him down either. What is with Charizard surviving everything under the sun in this run? Here I send in Mona for the 4 times damage Rock Tomb, and it takes several hits with him healing, but we eventually get the job done. In comes Lapras next, and I have no choice, so I go for Rock Tomb, but it doesn't do much at all before Blizzard hurts Mona bad into the red with Hail. We then miss our next attack though, so Brine takes down Mona. Here I can send in Dory though for the super effective Aura Sphere, but it survives on a sliver as well and nails us with a Blizzard. Dory eats it up pretty well though and can land two more attacks after he heals, granting us the victory over the world's strongest trainer. Unreal. Four deaths in the run and three Pokemon remaining, we beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Heart Gold with only fairy types, a type that really shouldn't even be in this game. That was incredibly fun though, I got to satisfy my curiosity as to how well the fairy type would operate in a Gen 4 game and it was a wickedly interesting time. I hope you had fun with the run too, and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next, and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.